Hey, Tizzy. Hi, Will. Okay, we got another one. Um, this is an incredible conversation with Bridget Velasco and Ralph Goto from Hawaii. Um, both Bridget and Ralph are incredible people. They're so knowledgeable and they have really driven the drowning prevention and water safety um, uh, effort forward, both in Hawaii and, uh, and in other spaces as well. So Tizzy, is there any background that we should know about before we jump into this conversation? Just a couple of things. They use the term DIPAC, and what that stands for is the Drowning and Aquatic Injury Prevention Advisory Committee. Right. They also use a term Kiki water safety. And for those of you who have not spent time in Hawaii, that is children's water safety. Okay. And then finally, it might be helpful for you to have context right from the beginning that this group is under the state health department. Right. And with that, let's get going. Hi, Ralph. Hey, Will. Hey, hey Ralph. Hi, Bridget. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Aloha. it's so good to see you both. And I've just been so inspired by uh, what you have done and what you are doing in Hawaii. Thank you very, very much for taking this time. So Ralph and Bridget, can you please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about each of you and your connection to water safety? Okay, I'll go first because my resume is probably a lot shorter than Ralph's. Um, I am currently facilitating the Drowning and Aquatic Injury Prevention Advisory Committee, which we have shut, uh, cut down to be called DIPAC. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in that role. I was the Drowning Prevention Coordinator with the state. I may be going back to that role that's kind of pending. Um, that, that role actually got frozen, a lot of background to that, which I won't go into, but um, so my background is pretty brief. I think we started, you know, to kind of delve into the first question, we started the coalition or the advisory in 2015, and I was hired on as the first state coordinator with the health department in 2014. That was the established position, and the position was established specifically because of work that um, Ralph and those guys had done lobbying for the funds for that. That's all. <laughs> I just spent a few years running this city and county ocean safety division, learned a little bit about public health, learned a lot about public health, um, and was really fortunate to have people here in the health department from a injury prevention and public health perspective talk and work with uh, lifeguards. Because traditionally lifeguard lifeguarding uh, you know, it's full of stereotypes. It's sitting in a tower, um, surfing when you can, talking to, you know, whoever happens to pass by and waiting for stuff to happen. And that's the traditional uh, image that we have. And, and I think we, sh we consciously made a decision to shift um, into more active prevention. So, you know, in, in doing that, we had to learn about injury prevention. So we, we, um, you know, got familiar with the Haddon matrix and all the wonderful things um, that are involved with data collection and bringing some science to, to the field, which, you know, in the past, up to that point really hadn't been done. So I, I think the, the connection between uh, ocean safety and lifeguards in general in, in Hawaii and the public health model um, and the injury prevention model really kind of spurned this whole deal on. Well, Ralph, you touched on um, so many important things there. And I, I would just like to recognize your contribution to water safety as a whole, but also um, as a lifeguard to lifeguarding. I mean, you pioneered um, so many advancements in the profession. And um, specifically, you talk about this shift towards a public health framework. Um, which requires, um, I think, uh, the ability to step outside what you know, and you did that masterfully. So thank you for your contribution to, to the field in, in so many different ways. But I want to take you both back to before DPAC was started. Bridget, you had mentioned that there was some advocacy and there was some kind of foundational work 
um, that happened. And so Ralph, I think you were involved in that. Can you describe like the lead up to actually getting a funded Department of Health drowning coordinator? Um, so the, the Hawaii Injury Prevention Plan that I mentioned is a plan that's worked over, I, they do it in five year chunks. And the last one, the one that I mentioned had the recommendation specific to developing an advisory committee. It was one of three recommendations. The other two were um, getting a health education campaign going and I forget what the other one was. Um, so when I stepped in um, to that, that role, the kind of the, the background that I was given was that um, ad hoc, these, um, you know, content experts had been meeting and they were kind of working up toward that anyway, but it wasn't really facilitated and organized. So it kind of came together. I think the timing was right. And I wouldn't be able to speak to actually the funding behind it. I know it had to do with general, I think it had to do with general funds, you know, just how the budgeting happened within the health department, the government side of it. I do know that the foundation was that, hey, all this time, basically Honolulu City County has been carrying the ball and we need to step up as we are with other injury injury areas such as suicide, car incidents, et cetera. So that's kind of that framework. Yeah, I think, you know, looking back uh, while I was still working, a, a lot of it had to do with strategy, funding strategies, okay? Like how can we justify more funds for personnel or for more equipment. And, you know, just to say there are so many drownings and so many rescues, that's what we did in the past. We, we had a, a, a pretty basic data collection system um, and used that and throw, threw those numbers out. But, you know, it wasn't until we got really involved with, um, you know, the actual how to do this and, and make that data or ship that data into meaningful information uh, that we could apply that to budget process. So then when we would um, meet with whoever was handing out the dough, uh, it wasn't just we had 12 drownings here. Um, I mean, the drownings are important to know, but you know, as we all know, that those aren't just the only indicators of, of success or no success. So I think, you know, we're able to do that and then we had a, a, a very um, supportive bunch of people at the health department. You know, I mean, drowning here is a, is a major issue. I think they recognize it. Um, we had good support from people in, um, like Bridget who did a lot of work and Dan Galanis is epidemiologist who's really helped us out, um, you know, making sense of those numbers and putting them into a form where we could use them. Can you speak a little bit more to how you've incorporated uh, EMS rescue type of data together with hospitalizations and death data? I think uh, many states, uh, Washington included, are challenged to bring in that component of the data. And we've recognized how much, how rich the information is, like from lifeguard response that doesn't get captured beyond the, the organization where it actually occurred, a city or county parks department. I think one of the, the unique things about the operation here, uh, I think the city and county lifeguard organization is the only one that is uh, in the same department as EMS. Mm -hmm. The other three county lifeguard operations are part of fire departments. And before that, they were part of Parks and Recreation. Um, and we were in Parks and Recreation for the first couple of years of my career. Um, but uniquely uh, to be partnered with EMS affords us a lot of access to things that the normal uh, lifeguard agencies are not uh, able to, to access. Um, and, you know, having medical response or emergency response people like brothers and sisters in EMS. Uh, usually the director of the department was a, was a physician or someone you know, who's, whose background really lended itself to that. So it was kind of a, I don't know if it was a natural fit, but it was a very opportune fit. And you know, the, the data that we collected and the data that, uh, that Dan was involved in 
you know, kind of neatly dovetailed. Uh, so ocean safety data and EMS data were kind of compatible. So to your point, the bringing together from an administrative standpoint where that data comes together may help with um, challenges others or California may have around HIPAA and sharing and that's my data set and so interesting. Thank you. I think we're still evolving because some of the gaps, you know, I would be interested in learning. I think I only got to go to one drowning prevention conference. It was in Arizona, but they spoke to some of the ways that I was interested because Dan will take and link the data, but even with a lifeguard incident, it's not saying it's drowning necessarily, right? Because the outcome might not be there. So he can link up to hospital, but then like our death records with the health department, they hold them pretty tight. So it, so yeah, I think there's still gaps. It's, it's better, it gets better, but um, in terms of like what Tizzy is saying with application to motivation for policy or administrative changes, we do the best we can, but we're, we'd love to learn also. I think you guys are really a on the forefront of um, that data linkage at the state level. There's some great examples of this happening locally, um, it, it, you know, in California or in other places. But uh, the fact that the state health department is looking at this for your entire region, I think, is um, really good. Even though there are still gaps and there's still you know uh, uh, things to accomplish, um, I want to move us on to talk a little bit about how the coalition is organized, how DPAC is organized. So you have some chairs and some co-chairs and subcommittees and how can you just briefly walk us through what <laughs> that structure looks like? It's actually pretty pretty basic, I think. Uh, we have two co-chair, uh, two chairs. And so Ralph is, <laughs> I think, perpetually one of them. <laughs> okay. You know, initially we had set it up for two years revolving, but COVID, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, and so they oversee the DIPAC. We had initially called it a task force. We switched that to an advisory committee because we re realized mm -hmm. we're not necessarily like, like we're more the advisors, right? So getting the heads together and then the thought was, okay, we we're going to make the, the subcommittees just kind of organically formed. It, I don't think it was even in our original plan. And so those subcommittees do have their own chairs, if you will. And how are those sub, how, how did you originally come up with those subcommittees? Yeah, because that there's was, a million different models and there's a lot of different groupings for this. How did you come up with your subcommittees? It was just by what we would look at as our priorities and what we would keep coming up against at the meetings and knowing we're not having enough time, energy, people to deal with this at hand as we are meeting. So we, we need a separate group for that. So the first one was the, cake, the child water safety Mm -hmm. subcommittee that developed and that was actually pretty big and strong for a while we lost a, a, quite a bit of our leadership of late for that and the idea is for those subcommittees to take the act the you know the recommendations and really interact with leadership at DIPAC I think it's pretty loose I, I'd like to work on tightening that up mm -hmm. a little bit more the other subcommittee we have is the snorkel safety subcommittee yeah. Um, which we, we were fortunate to get some funding from the Tourism Authority, which was pretty unique. Um, you know, where we studied the snorkels and the equipment and the full face masks and the uh, lack of swimming ability, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that study has pretty much run its course. We're out of money. Uh, we did not come up with any definitive uh, conclusions. Our, our conclusion was we need to we need more funding to study this more <laughs> so someone can apply for grant but you know the subcommittees I think are, were formed just because those were the, the issues going mm -hmm. on at the time and so how are you gonna how are you gonna uh, you know really address those so the people in the KK water safety committee uh, you know historically are the people that do the learn to swim or tried for years to do a swimming program. Um, and, you know, the snorkeling thing was because of the, the number of drownings in the incident. Sure. And, you know, it was with visitors. So that's how we got the visitor industry uh, involved with it. Yeah, I was going to ask you a follow up on that. So um, you have, I know that you have worked with uh, tourism and 
both probably at a state at a government level and um, you know with industry. Can you describe a little bit of what that relationship has looked like and um, maybe some of the the good things or the challenges about working in and around tourism in Hawaii? Yeah, my, during my whole career, when I was working as a government employee, uh, there were certain constraints that we all have as, as employees. Um, we tried to meet with the visitor industry folks for years. And, you know, the message was, hey, you guys are marketing this place. You're using the beach to bring people here. So you have some kind of responsibility to deal with them when you get here. For years, that was just never addressed. And, and finally, we were able to make some progress in meeting with people. And, you know, I think what happened and what happens in a lot of cases is the stars align and the right people are in the right place. So we were fortunate to be able to talk to some people because we knew them and we knew some people on the board of the Tourism Authority that were sympathetic that were ocean people that knew what was going on and so they were they were very instrumental in helping us make that progress so we went from you know them really not wanting to talk about it to okay they recognized that uh drownings with with visitors was an issue and then to the point where they actually actively got involved with us in terms of funding and social media timing and just regular media timing helped that, I'm sure, right? Yeah. So that, that it, like Ralph said, I think it was in his back days, it was, you know, them, you're, you're scaring at people, don't talk. And now it's like, oh, when's your guys' next meeting? We want to do a photo with you guys, right? So it oh. has changed a lot. And so one of the outcomes, like really concrete, was they paid for one of our um, public service announce our PSA videos to be played at all the county airport, the state airports right. in each county. Um, and they paid for that real estate. And then that got, that, that got pulled with COVID. So that's like next on our list to go say, okay, people know how to wash their hands, go put the video back on. People are kept, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> wow. Can you talk a little bit more about how people become members of whether it be mm -hmm. subcommittees or the advisory committee? Mm -hmm. uh, people yeah. or organizations? Yeah, so I, I put in the, the notes that I sent you guys that, I don't know, if somebody's like up and starting, I would probably do it how we did it, which was pretty formal. We sent like a, a letter from like the direct, the health director had signed it, that you were formally invited and you need your, your supervisor's permission and all this stuff. And that was chosen basically based on who people knew were the guys to get at the table. And then from there, it was, you know, spread from there where if somebody leaves, then they make sure they recommend someone to them. And, and then it you know, we take it to a vote, but there's no list of requirements beyond having somewhere in your organization's mission that you, I think it's just, I, I don't even know how I word it. I have to look at our structure and guidelines, but that there's some water safety um, responsibility in your mission, as well as ability to attend the meetings. Sure. So, I, and I want to ask a quick follow-up on that because governance and structure is so important, important for getting this rolling. Um, as far as I know, you are the only coalition that's actually housed inside of a government agency. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these other groups in the states are housed either as independent nonprofits or they live under a, you know, like an elite organization type of model. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the challenges and, and benefits of doing this work from inside a state agency? Mm -hmm. I don't know, because I haven't been able to do anything different. I mean, I did speak with the Arizona nonprofit um, and they kind of like, you know, we were just starting and they kind of like warned me, you guys need to switch to a nonprofit. You're going to have a hard time with, you know, getting just people to like, I guess, believe in you kind of thing. I feel like because we have everybody, we have the nonprofits, the business side, we have, you know, like you mentioned, the tourism side, we have military side representation. Mm -hmm. So even though you look at, like me, I work for the health department and we do get a little bit of funding from my program. And technically right now, the website is owned by the health department. That's the only involvement we do. We do have in our, in our um, one of the roles of the advisory is to report to, I don't know if it's my director or the health director herself mm -hmm. 
on our recommendations, which we have, you know, had the, um, I think when the, the full face mask thing came up, we got called in to speak to that, yeah. you know, the advisory. Yeah. But other than that, I don't, I don't, I can't really think of any, I don't know, Ralph might have any opinions on that. I, I think it was, um, you know, just looking around and saying, okay, who would be, you know, who would be good to have on this, on, in this group? Um, for instance, the lifeguard, you know, we have representation from our lifeguard agencies, but we also wanted to, to get, you know, who was above them because mm -hmm. the lifeguard chief could say all he wanted, but unless he had the support, you know, the big boss, you know, it was kind of uh, futile. Um, health department obviously lends uh, a lot of credence to, to the effort. And when you say, well, DITAC is part of health, health department, um, you know, that, that gives it some juice. And, and I think that that's important to identify uh, who you want to get involved and what they're going to be able to bring to the table. Okay, I just have um, a couple more questions as we wrap up. I, and here's where I want to go. I want to talk about some successes that you guys have had. I want to talk about some challenges that you guys have had. And I want to get your advice or recommendations for people who are just starting out and embarking on this work. So let's start with successes. Um, what are a couple of the, the things that um, DIPAC has accomplished that you would feel really proud about um, and call a success? I would say just getting ourselves together and organized and, you know, meeting in the same room or virtually yeah. continuously for however, since 2015, I think we've maybe missed one meeting. I think that was at the very start of COVID maybe. Mm -hmm. So just that in and of itself, like I said, I, I feel like there's a lot of potential. We've laid the groundwork. What we did our first two years really was just have guest speaker. I mean, we, you know, laid out this plans and, you know, what are we doing, but we really just had a lot of guest speakers in different from you know pediatricians, neurologists, we had um, you know folks from the tourism authority. You know, really just try to lay down a common foundation of knowledge for the group. So just that in of, in itself, I think we did pretty good with that, and that we're still around. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think the the other one I listed in in you know your questionnaire was that we did um, group together and make decisions around things that, you know, maybe I was doing as part of my job, but really it was the advisory that I looked to, to give that direction to our visitor campaign, our, our drawn mm -hmm. prevention. And that campaign took about two years just to, you know, from inception of data to product. Yeah. So I, I would definitely give that um, kudos to the, the advisory. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that has happened is that the, uh, advisory committee has pretty much established itself as um, what, what would you say? Y you know, the, they're not. We're not the experts, but you know, if DIPEC says, "Okay, well, we support this because of this," I think there's credibility, um, and I think that you know, bringing everybody to the table to discuss stuff like that. Uh, help the credibility. Like um, we go to the legislature or we go to city council and talk about stuff and it's not just individual speaking or the lifeguard association, you know, it, it's the DIPAC the group and it's mm -hmm. supported, uh, supported yeah. by everyone and you've list everyone that's involved. And, and that does lend credibility to, to, you know, what we're trying to do. And it may help with the funding. I think that it, it certainly did with, um, with the snorkel study. You know, if we just came out of the blue and said we need money to do the study, uh, I don't think we would have, have gotten the funding that we did. Sure. Okay, moving on to some challenges. What has been difficult in keeping this thing running and, and um, moving the needle? Meeting has been not too hard. Getting people together has been okay. Um, even if we sometimes will have five or six, I think one meeting we had like five or six people, but I think just, you know, we have a lot of great ideas. We have a, you know, such a huge, robust knowledge base and, and experience base. And then the action, like making things actionable. I think we're a little bit still struggling with if this is what is like our role 
And so we'll get excited about getting stuff done, but then everybody has like their full-time job or their full-time retirement. I mean, you know, otherwise, cause it does like, it, it isn't fair. Like a lot of things do get pushed to Ralph and, and our other chair. And um, so just really trying to spread the load a little bit more or figure out how to delegate those to, to the, so I, I think part of that though is on me where, you know, we have people from like one person from, you know, one city and county or county ocean safety entity come and then do they really communicate that information back to their entity? Like how, how much is that sharing really going on? And so then that would affect participation, right? Because if they're invested in outcome. So that I think is one of the bigger challenges. Ralph, right what now. do you think is a, is a I think challenge? Is, you know, now that you mentioned that, I think one of the, uh, the challenges for me is, especially was, okay, it's great to sit around in this wonderful little group of experts, okay, but, you know, how does that affect the guy on the beach? Mm -hmm. okay. And what's in it for him? You know, why, sure. why should he take, the, he or she take the time to get the person's snorkel and take a picture of it and save it uh, so that we can, you know, do this study? They have no interest in doing that. You know that, Will. And you're talking um, you're talking about lifeguards on the beach that would be following yeah, up in. And, and, or just, you know, just just the practitioners. What's in it for them? Mm. You know, the guy at the pool, the people at the pool, what, you know, how's that going to help them with their, with their programming? And I think that that's really important. I don't know if it's a challenge, but I think it's really important to keep in your mind as you're going through, you know, these wonderful planning ideas. And that's, yeah, I think that um, creating shared value, right? Where yeah. they, they see the value in participating and following through yes. on some of these options. Yeah. Thank you, Bridget and Ralph, so much for this incredibly helpful advice. And speaking of advice, as different water safety advocates and stakeholders across the country begin to think about what a coalition might look like in their own region, what advice or guidance would you offer for people who are thinking about or just starting off on this journey or one that someone's now been on for the last six or seven years? They got, they got to know the, like, like if they know the lay of their land already and that's what's the impetus to get the coalition, that's one thing. Like for me, it was kind of already a lot of the work that legwork had been done. So I came in kind of, this is what needs to get done because that, that part had already been done. And that being said, though, we still took a year to really lay out what we wanted from this group. And the, the shell, we kept it, I, I would advise having a shell, you know, something kind of standardized, but also being really open to making sure that discussion happens to be open to changing that rather mm -hmm. than we need to get like going in first meeting, okay, in three years, we want to get 5% less drowning or whatever, right? You know, that's, you definitely want to have all that conversation hashed out there is there is time to it you know I think our first couple meetings we went three four hours and now we've kind of cut it down to an hour hour and a half you know but we could and that's partially the zoom thing well probably mostly the zoom team thing but yeah. that would be one of my bigger pieces of advice yeah so so going into the process um flexible being ready to be flexible and um change your ideas and kind of evolve with the need yeah, making sure that, you know, if you're talking about kind of what Ralph was saying, if you're talking about making an effect on somebody, make sure you get their voice into mm -hmm. what that really means. Yeah, and that kind of public health 101, right? Just getting the the input before doing working toward the output. Ralph, what advice would you offer to uh, people who are starting out? If they're starting, the, the guys that are starting out, one is what, what are they trying to accomplish? you know and and set some goals and you know be realistic about them i mean what do they do they say act. what do you do you think globally and you act locally right. you know so you have these wonderful missions and and that's what it is it's drowning prevention and injury prevention but then break it down to okay where what's happening here because what's happening in arizona is different from what's happening you know in in la so Absolutely. I think taking into account all the differences and trying to find a common denominator is going to be really important to be clear from the beginning about what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you can't or you're not going to solve, you know, all the problems of the universe.
Ralph, Bridget, thank you so much for this really incredible conversation. Uh, Tizzy and I and anyone else who um, gets to listen to this has a lot to learn from you and the other Hawaiians who've been involved with Deepak and your experience. And again, just thank you so much for spending some time with us today. No problem. Well, Anytime. Well, glad to be a part of it. All right. Thanks both. Talk Very to you well. soon. You. It's really yeah. nice to see thank you. you. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay.